and uh, kind of learn a bit about how we can get started with some of the uh, options that are out there available for uh, stateful serverless. And we're going to start with a quote from one of my favorite books out there. Um, so a race of hyper-intelligent pan-dimensional beings once built themselves a gigantic supercomputer called Deep Thought to calculate once and for all the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. And for seven and a half billion, well, million years, Deep Thought computed and calculated, and in the end announced that the answer was, in fact, 42. And so another even bigger computer had to be built to find out what the actual question was. And this computer, which was called the Earth, was so large that it was frequently mistaken for a planet. And sadly, however, just before the critical moment of the readout, the Earth was unexpectedly demolished by the Vogons so that they can make way, or so they claimed, uh, for a new hyperspace bypass. And so all hope for discovering a meaning for life was lost forever. And I'm pretty sure after reading all of this that Douglas Adams was secretly a fan of serverless. And here's a few common patterns and challenges that are very much serverless related that we can immediately identify in the previous paragraphs. It's either me that I'm a huge serverless fan and I see everything in everything that I'm reading as being serverless, or again, maybe Douglas Adams was a huge serverless fan. Uh, so let's start with a few challenges that are related to maintaining state. Uh, it seems like we were able to compute the answer to the ultimate question, but then when we had to recompute what the ultimate question, what the actual ultimate question was, um, in between the lines, it seems it sounds like we have also a coordination, um, or we're looking at a coordination of long-running tasks. Um, and hey the Vogans destroyed the planet just before the readout. Um, and if this doesn't sound like a function timeout, then I don't really know what does. And I'm also pretty sure that Douglas Adam was one of the first thought leaders uh, that came up with a set of recommendations and best practices for serverless. Um, so the first thing, um, functions should be stateless or must be stateless. Um, you cannot rely on state being preserved in memory from one call to another. Um, the cloud provider actually counts on this to ease provisioning of resources and uh, build fault tolerance into our applications. Um, also, a key best practice and uh, recommendation within the serverless ecosystem is that functions shouldn't call other functions. And in fact, functions should do only one thing uh, and abide the single responsibility principle, which states that every single module class or function should have responsibility over a single part of the functionality that is provided by the software. Uh, and that responsibility should be entirely encapsulated by the function itself. Um, and how we separate the functionality for our software into smaller functions or generally into modules in our applications, it also determines how our application will scale um, and will impact our deployment strategy as well. Um, you, whenever we build applications, we must find the critical components in our applications and the critical path for our users and then isolate them in separate parts of our applications, in separate functions, and separate nano functions. You can think about this um, in terms of um, very similar to how you used to think about microservices or how you um, still think about microservices. Um, ideally, you want to have logic that's related to, for example, authentication in a completely separate and independent component. That's part of your critical path of your uh, software and you want to make sure that it won't be impacted by changes um, that you have to deploy for other parts of your applications like let's say maybe product management. If you're building an e-commerce application then these two uh, parts of your applications should be built in separate microservices or nano services as we call them in serverless. 
And all of these challenges and all of these restrictions actually put us in a very challenging place when it comes to building complex applications using serverless. Uh, realistic applications will need fast access to uh, our data and to our state. And these constraints that we mentioned earlier, they actually force functions to access all of our data completely remotely, and it forces them to externalize all state into remote cloud storage um, with the goal to preserve all of that state across calls or even to communicate between one function to another. So basically pass state from one function to another. Uh, two functions currently can only communicate through an auto scaling intermediary service. Um, so today that means either services like Azure Blob Storage or S3 or even Azure Cosmos DB, but all of these options are actually radically slower and much more expensive than the point to point networking that we're all used to. So my name is Simona Kotin. Uh, I work as a cloud advocate at Microsoft. You can find me on Twitter at Simona underscore Kotin. Um, and you might also know me from uh, Serverless Days London. I'm one of the co-organizers of the event that usually happens in London. I've also contributed to um, Serverless Days Amsterdam, uh, not Amsterdam, I've keynoted Serverless Days Amsterdam uh, last week, last month but also uh, helped with organizing serverless days Boston and I'm pretty active and a huge fan of the serverless days community uh, generally. If some of you are not aware of this and are interested in connecting with the serverless community, we have a Slack channel uh, which I'll maybe share the link in the meetup page that you can all um, kind of join and uh, get to know some of other folks that are active in the serverless community. Uh, I'm also, uh, you might also know me from hosting Build Live uh, two weeks ago, probably, uh, and a few other or, uh, conferences like Concatenate um, and Plural Site. I've co created a few courses in partnership with John Papa. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm generally a um, web developer with a huge passion for serverless applications. And you might also know me from 25 Days of Serverless. That was a um, extremely fun project to work on, uh, which basically focused on learning serverless during the month of December through a series of very, very fun challenges that um, took us across the world uh, with different traditions that are available for Christmas in those parts of the world. I highly recommend you check it out as well. I'll post the link in the meetup page uh, once this session is over. Okay, but going back to serverless, uh, let's have a look at um, a simple example of how um, we might be using serverless or what would be the requirements for us to implement an application. So, um, or even a smaller part of our application. I mentioned earlier authentication. So let's have a look at um, what we need in order to implement a two-factor authentication feature. Um, so we need a basic workflow that um, a basic workflow that allows us to generate a random code, send that code to the user's secondary device that can be their phone or um, maybe their iPad. Um, we need to wait for the users to send back that the code that they received. Then we have to verify that the code is the one that we generated and that it was provided within the suggested time limit that we uh, we enforce. And in practice with serverless, we would have to have a function that generates the random code um, that will use uh, an output binding to send a text via, uh, via a Twilio API. And then that also at the same time saves the code in a remote storage account. Remember, we talked about Azure Storage Blob, uh, Blob Storage, um, Azure Cosmos DB. You can, once you generate that code, you can easily put it into uh, one of those data sources. We would also create a function that gets triggered when the code is submitted. Um, it reads the user code from storage, it compares the two and it checks that the time limit wasn't exceeded, um, and then it returns the user data to our application. And even with this very simple task, we had to access uh, remote storage at least twice. And of course, that has an impact on latency and it results usually in poorer and 
user performance and the end user experience. And at the end of the day, we're all building applications and we're building software and products with the goal to provide um, a great user experience as well as make things easier. So in this case, it sounds a bit like we're not we're not doing that. Um, it also adds complexity to developer productivity. Um, it's much, it's now much harder to uh, reason and visualize our application as a whole. We now need to understand what's the relationship between our functions and the queues and data stores. And then when we look at a flat list of cloud resources, it's a lot much harder to actually figure everything out. We might have to maybe use some software that allows us to create diagrams and um, but that also introduces the burden of having to update all of those designs um, for for ourselves. In the very controversial paper that I highly recommend you all read, uh, serverless computing one step forward, two steps back. The authors argue that one of the biggest architectural shortcomings of functions as a service platforms is actually the fact that they essentially implement a data shipping architecture. Um, serverless functions are running in isolated VMs or containers, very separate from where the data is. Um, and in addition, several uh, functions are also short lived. Um, so that means that um, you can your code can only run for maybe five minutes or depending on how much your provider will allow you to uh, to run those functions for it can be 10 minutes or 15 minutes. But regardless, um, once that time is reached, your function will time out and will not return to the user. So short lived um, and they're also non addressable. Um, so their so their capacity to cache state internally for repeated requests is limited. Um, and hence with serverless, we are shipping data to code rather than shipping code to data. And this has implications in latency, bandwidth, and of course, cost. And as the paper states, um, this is a recurring architectural anti-pattern among system designers, which database aficionados seem to need to point out every single generation uh, out there. But of course, there's a lot of research that's being done at the moment to push the boundaries of how we manage state in serverless. Um, and I'd like to spend the next few minutes just to go through uh, two different solutions and highlight two different solutions that I think you're going to find very interesting. And both of them come from academia. So narrowing the gap, the gap between serverless uh, and its state with storage functions is a paper that introduces a fix for the data shipping architecture or proposes a fix for the data shipping architecture. Uh, the paper describes Shed Shredder, which is a low latency multi tenant cloud store that allows for small units of computation to be performed directly within storage nodes. And this is by no means a new idea. Uh, on the mainframe, we used to call it function shipping. And in databases, you probably know it as the very well loved stored procedures. Um, and the, the key goals of Shredder are um, that tenants should be able to embed arbitrary functions within storage, and those functions should have seamless access to the ten tenant's data. A tenant should not be able to see the code or data of other tenants. Um, this basically is a very important uh, feature of serverless as well, which, which gives us isolation for our code and for our data. Uh, it should also support thousands of tenant functions with fine grained resource tracking so that we can ma maximize resource utilization. And of course, the goal is to also achieve uh, high performance for our applications and our users. And internally, Shredder consists of three layers. Uh, we have a networking layer, a storage layer, and the function layer. And each CPU core runs all three layers, but CPU cores also follow a shared nothing design principle. The state of these layers is partitioned across CPU cores in order to avoid contention and synchronization overheads. And the storage layer hosts all tenants data in memory and has um, the key put or the get put uh, key value interface. Um, 
And the network layer handles network connections, uh, protocol processing, and the results of all tenants. And for each incoming request, um, this will call through the first through the storage layer. And if, if the request is a simple get put operation, um, and if a request specifies a particular storage function, then the network layer calls through the function layer. And finally, the function layer matches incoming requests to their storage function code and context, and it executes the operation within a per core instance of the V8 runtime. Cloudburst, another uh, proposal for um, addressing some of the stateful serverless needs that we're currently seeing. Um, it uses a more common data shipping architecture um, or pattern so that it brings data to caches that are uh, next to our functions runtimes. And the key ingredients of Cloudburst are a highly scalable key value store for persistent state that's called ANA. Um, as well as local caches, which are co-located with function execution environments um, and cache consistency protocols so that we can preserve developer sanity, which is extremely important, uh, while data is moved in and out of those caches. Um, and the key goals of Cloudburst are that uh, a running function's hot data should be kept physically nearby so that we have low latency access. Uh, updates should be allowed at any function invocation site, and then cross-function communication should work at wire speed. Um, the programming model that's being used in Cloudburst is um, using Python. And interestingly, the paper also introduces the concept of logical disaggregation and physical collocation. Uh, auto scaling in serverless platforms is enabled by the disaggregation of storage and compute services. So when we separate those two, it's much easier to auto scale and manage granularly uh, different resources um, so that we can meet the workflow requirements. But disaggregation is needed to also provision and to be able to build storage and compute independently. Uh, but with Cloudburst, the goal is to deploy resources to different services um, in very close physical proximity. And there are four key components. Uh, we have the function exec uh, <laughs> executors, the caches, the function schedulers, and a resource management system. Um, user requests are being received by a scheduler, which then routes them to the function executors. I always have issues pronouncing this word. Uh, each scheduler operates independently, and then the system relies on a standard stateless cloud uh, load balancer. Um, and the function executors, they run in individual processes that are packed into VMs, along with a local, um, local cache per each VM. And the cache on each VM uh, basically intermediates between the local executors and the remote key value stores. Um, all Cloudburst components are then run in individual Docker containers, um, and then Cloudburst uses Kubernetes so that it can start containers and redeploy them whenever um, we encounter failure. And these solutions, they both optimize for low latency um, and fixing the data shipping uh, issue. But another challenge that we mentioned in the beginning was actually the ability to coordinate long running tasks um, and this is another type of state that we need to maintain. Um, a second class of really common use cases, um, they leverage serverless functions simply to coordinate uh, calls to auto scaling services, such as large scale analytics or even machine learning APIs. So let's have a look at an application that I built recently, which is inspired by the incredible Parks and Recreation TV series. I hope that all of you out there are huge fans. Um, otherwise, what am I even doing here? <laughs> uh, but yeah, my goal with building this application was uh, to showcase how we can use serverless workflows to train machine learning models. This has been something that I've been exploring with in the past few years, um, and I think we're getting closer and closer to being able to use serverless for machine learning, which is exciting. Um, in, in, Actually, in most cases, uh, folks will use um, serverless functions to 
basically host the machine learning models and uh, build prediction APIs within the serverless endpoints. But in this case, what I wanted to prove is that we can also train uh, serverless, train machine learning models using serverless, which is um, a more challenging feat. Now you'll see that I cheated a bit, um, uh, but let's let's go to the application and then uh, we'll talk more about how I cheated. Um, in, in Azure, we have a product that's called Custom Vision AI, and that allows you to run custom vision predictions by building custom models using transfer learning. So basically you're benefiting from all of the training and all of the models that Microsoft has built um, in the past years. Um, and through transfer learning, we're able to customize those models so that they are useful for our own needs. And to do that, what we need to do is create a new project in Custom Vision AI. Then we need to create a series of tags um, and upload images for those tags. And another question that you might ask is, um, how many images do I need for some of these models? Well, you'll learn that um, the minimum number of images that you can upload per tag is actually somewhere between five images and 20 images. So because we're using transfer learning, you can already notice that we don't necessarily need as many images as we usually do need for training machine learning models. Okay, so creating a series of tags, uploading images for each of those tags, um, and then we can immediately train a new model. And that will give us an API that we can use to make predictions. Basically, um, upload an image and ask our model, does this look like um, some any of the tags that you already have in your model? Um, and then the API will um, give you back a series of percentages of confidence that that particular image resembles a different um, object that has been created in the custom vision AI. Uh, so in, for my particular dog, a spirit dog application, I'm actually using an existing data set of images of dogs that has been published by Stanford. Um, I train a custom model using a custom vision AI and then upload a picture of myself to see what's my spirit dog. Um, and actually, it's not a picture of myself uh, in this particular screenshot. It's a picture of Tom. Um, so I, I ran quickly tests here in the directly in the interface of Custom Vision AI, and when I upload a picture, I can I, I can see here a list of probabilities um, for what is Tom's spirit dog. So in this case, we can see that he is um, we're 50 percent, 53 percent certain that uh, Tom looks like a silky terrier. That's a tag that I've created, and then based on the training that I've done. Uh, I get that percentage back. Okay, uh, and fortunately, actually, you you can you can do all of this work manually, uh, but we also have an API that allows us to run all the model training steps using code. So I don't have to actually create tags and upload images manually. Um, so given the uh, data set with dog images, we'll iterate over each dog breed that we have in our data set. And then we create a tag in Custom Vision AI, upload uh, the images for that particular breed. And once all of the tasks are completed, then I, I want to go ahead and train the model uh, so we can run predictions, which is the exciting part, right? Uh, but before we go uh, and see the code we use to get this implemented, um, I wanted us to look a bit at, at some of the properties of our orchestration systems. Um, in this particular paper comparison of functions as a service or FAS uh, orchestration systems, it diligently documents a comparison of uh, some of the major function as a service orchestration systems out there. Um, and this is a great resource that we can use to help inform our thinking when we start evaluating different options that we have available. Um, and to and they take into consideration several important metrics, um, but we'll look into details for only three of them. Uh, those are the programming model, state management, and architecture. Um, so the first one, the programming model, it refers to 
uh, programming simplicity and the set of coding abstractions that we have available when we're building applications using this particular, any particular framework. Um, the architectural uh, metric, it tells us whether the orchestrator will, can uh, be an external entity not implemented as a function um, or as part of a runtime itself as a function scheduled in reaction to events. And then state management, it tells us how data is being passed from one function to the next. And I'll use a, an, an, as an example Azure Durable Functions, which is an extension of Azure Functions that will let you write stateful functions in a serverless compute environment. Um, and this is an implementation that's actually open source uh, and it's been built by Microsoft, but in collaboration with some of um, our community and our wonderful MVPs, as well as people that are in companies that are using Azure Durable Functions at the moment. Um, and this particular extension will let you define stateful workflows by writing orchestrator functions using Azure Functions programming model. Uh, and behind the scenes, the extension will manage states, check in, uh, checkpoints, um, and it will restart for us, allowing us to focus on the business logic that we need to implement. And with Azure Durable Functions, we can define uh, workflows directly in code. So programming model um, is very similar to what you would expect it to be whenever you're building applications using C Sharp or JavaScript or F Sharp. Um, it supports powerful abstractions like function chaining, retries, uh, parallel spawning, like the fan out and fan in uh, functionality. Um, and it also provides a complete reflective API that allows us to query the current state of a given orchestration. So we can see whether it has started, whether it has uh, it's in progress or if it has failed and see the error message there. Um, and then we can also trigger events to any current orchestration that is running or waiting um, and we can terminate it if needed. Its software architecture is an extension of the reactive core um, and specifically the architecture is based on the durable task framework which enables development of long running workflows using a pattern called event sourcing. Uh, if you've uh, watched or, or read any of Martin Fowler's uh, blogs or uh, talks, you, will, you probably are familiar with event sourcing or even if you're building applications using microservices, it sounds familiar. Um, basically, this pattern, pattern stores all events that are produced by function calls um, into a, a storage account. So in the case of Azure Functions, it will store them in um, Azure Blob Storage. And then um, it enables this programming model, enables us to uh, replay all events um, and the, it gives us the ability to restore any from any previous state. Um, and all the events are stored using queues, tables, and blobs. And the key benefit of this approach is that the orchestrator function can be hibernated and later restored and uh, pick up from any point where it was um, it it left off. And using event sourcing, the orchestrator function is replaying its state every time an activity function returns. And this means that the orchestration function code must be deterministic. Um, so in our case, we need to make sure that we're not actually making any IO calls, um, things like um, modifying um, a timer or expecting reacting to a timer um, or yeah, making any non-deterministic calls. Um, that code will basically prevent our orchestration orchestrator to function properly um, and give us the expected results. Um, and state management. Um, as mentioned earlier, in this case, it refers to how we pass state between functions and Azure Durable Functions. It does not restrict the size of the state parameters that are being passed across different functions. But because this information is logged for fault tolerance, um, Azure Durable Functions actually stores the parameters that are larger than 60 kilobytes in a compressed form. Um, and this way it can avoid overhead penalties and it can reduce the, uh, the storage costs. And 
With durable functions, there there's multiple types of functions, and um, the the two most most common uh, ones are the orchestrator function and the activity functions. Um, and the orchestrator functions they describe how actions are executed and the order in which they're executed. Um, an orchestrator can have many different types of actions, including activity functions, sub orchestrators, and timers. Um, Activity functions are the basic unit uh, of work in a durable orchestration, and they're very similar to our regular Azure functions or serverless functions. Um, and this is where we do all of our IO work, all of our non-deterministic work that we might want to do. And the third type is our client function, uh, which can be an HTTP triggered function, and it's responsible usually for starting the orchestrator function. And going back to our spirit dog application, um, this is the schema of how our orchestrator looks like. Uh, we start by running an activity function that retrieves the list of dog breeds, um, and then it returns it in the form of an array. Um, and then when we iterate over each item in, in the array, and we kick off a, con a concurrent sub -orchestrator orchestration. And this is where we chain two different functions uh, that are responsible for creating tags in Custom Vision AI, as well as uploading images for those tags. And then once all tasks are completed, then we can train our custom model successfully and then make all of the predictions that we wanted to. All right, so now let's go have a quick look at a, at a demo. Uh, let me see once I... Exit the presentation. Hopefully you can still see my screen. And I'll show you first how you can how you can go ahead and create a new function. Uh, and I actually a new durable function. And I actually have already have an instance of VS Code uh, running here. So if, if you've seen any of my presentations before, you know how much I um, love VS Code. And more than that, um, there's this really awesome integration between Azure Functions and uh, VS Code. So um, we have this Azure Functions extension that you can easily use. Um, it's available here in, the, in VS Code. Um, and you can see here that it will basically allow you to create new functions. Uh, run and debug functions locally and then deploy them to the cloud. Um, and all of this is enabled by the fact that the Azure Functions runtime is open source. So whenever you install the Azure Functions core tools locally, um, you're actually running the runtime that's being run in the cloud as well. Um, so then you can also trust that the experience that you get locally is actually going to be very similar to what you're running in the cloud as well. All right. So I, I already have this uh, extension installed, um, so I don't have to uh, go ahead and install it, but um, I, I strongly advise you to do that whenever you're, um, you're trying to build serverless applications using Azure Functions. So the next thing that I'll do here is going into the Azure, um, Azure icon here in, on the uh, left-hand side of, uh, of my VS Code instance. You can see here that I have multiple uh, extensions installed, but the ones that the one that we really care about is the functions one. And in order to get started with durable functions, um, I'm going to go ahead and click here um, that say that I want to create a new function project, and it's going to ask me what's the folder that I want to create that function into. Um, let's say I created one that's called Reactor. Um, and then you can see here that there's multiple languages that are being supported. So uh, JavaScript, TypeScript, C Sharp, Python, Java, PowerShell, if you're interested in that. Uh, but I'll go ahead with JavaScript. And then I want to create a durable functions HTTP starter. This is our client function that will um, we will be able to that HTTP triggered and it will actually create our orchestration. Um, uh, it will start our orchestration. So I'm going to go ahead and rename this to starter. And then this will go ahead and create for us a few things. So it will create 
a VS Code configuration that um, has all the configuration that's required for us to debug our projects, then um, also a folder with our function that's called starter, the same name that we had for our uh, starter function or client function. And then function.json, uh, we can see here an array of bindings. So th this, this is um, a series of a series of connectors that help us speed our development um, uh, with Azure Functions. And here we can see that we're listening to HTTP uh, functions, and then we're listening to those um, HTTP requests at the route that's orchestrator, and then we're passing in the function name that we want to trigger, um, and then we're returning an HTTP response. Um, and it, it's actually, um, it also has this specific configuration that tells us that this is a, a orchestration client um, and it has the name starter. Uh, and then in index.js, uh, we can see here that we're using durable functions. So already this tells us that, hey, we might have to um, install durable functions. So I'm going to go ahead and already do that. Uh, when I go into package.json, we can see that we have no dependency here. So the first thing that we have to do is run npm install durable functions. And again, this package is available on npm and it's open source for all of you to try um, to try figure it out. Um, and then once I install durable functions, we can see that um, we're using this durable functions object where um, retrieving the uh, client from our context, and then we want to start a new function that's being passed as a parameter to our function. We're logging information about our orchestration ID, and then we're uh, creating a status report that we're then returning to our uh, our clients. But this is not enough. Um, we, we, we're seeing the client function, but then we also have to make sure that we're also creating our orchestration, um, remember there's three elements that we, or three types of functions that we have with durable functions. The first one is the client function. The second one is the orchestration function um, or the workflow basically. And then the third type is our activity function, which is basically our worker function. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and create a new function here. Um, and this is going to be an, of type orchestrator. So durable functions orchestrator, Let's name it, let's give it a shorter name, orchestrator. Uh, and by default, we can see here that um, it's already created, again, a new folder that's called orchestrator. And our function here is, um, again, depending on durable functions, um, it, it receives as a parameter a context uh, object. Uh, we can see that this is a generator function. So where we can here use the wonderful uh, generator patterns um, and yield or await for our functions to return um, to return the result. And here we can see that we are initializing a new array um, called outputs, and then we're pushing the results of each uh, call activity function, which we're not sure what it does, but it seems like it's trying to call an, a hello function. Um, sending it this particular um, input and then putting the output into the outputs array. Um, so finally, we actually need to create the activity function. And the way I'm going to do that, going back into our Azure extension here, I'm going to create a new function and this is our activity function. Um, and let's see that we name it hello, uh, just like we named it in the, the orchestrator. Um, and this particular function will just return hello and then um, return the name of the parameter we've just passed. So if I save all of this and now I try to run it, uh, the first thing that will tell me, remember with durable functions, we mentioned that we have to store state in a storage account, which means that we have to actually define that storage account. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, use an existing uh, storage account that's 30 durable uh, days. You can see there how wishful, how much wishful thinking I had 30 days of durable functions. Uh, okay, so I'm going to copy this URL. Uh, so this is the localhost 7070 orchestrator. And remember, we wanted to uh, call the um, uh, starter function. 
and let me just bring in my my postman instance right here and once I put in the URL here so this is localhost 7071 slash API orchestrators slash starter um, and this I think this should be a post function uh, but we're gonna check it out immediately uh, and once I send We can see it. we have a 500 error, and this tells us that the operation failed with an unexpected status code 500. Something went wrong while processing your request. So as you can imagine, I updated my resources in my Azure Functions runtime recently, and I'm not sure what is happening here. Never do that. Before a demo, let me just give it another try here. But if anyone has any kind of suggestions on why this would be happening, please let me know. What I really wanted to show you was that you can also debug these functions and uh, unfortunately, this hasn't made my life easier. But you can see here that we're listening to the orchestrator path and then we're taking in the starter function we're passing in the starter function name. And in theory, that should actually, once it's being triggered by the starter function, it should start a new orchestrator uh, using the function name that we've seen earlier. So that's our starter function. Oh, it should be our orchestrator, orchestrator function. Let's see if that works. Okay, let me just show you uh, the example of how I implemented the uh, Durable, the Spirit Dog application, and then uh, I'm gonna debug this after our session just to make sure that I understand what's happening there. Okay, cool. So we start with our starter function, which is exactly the same that you've seen earlier, uh, where uh, we retrieve the client from durable functions and we start our new function. Um, and then this is our orchestrator function that, um, as I mentioned earlier, it retrieves a list of breeds um, by calling uh, an activity function that returns that list of breeds. Um, then what we're doing is we're creating a list, uh, an empty array that will um, contain all of our sub orchestrators uh, and sub orchestrator functions, and then it will await for all of those sub orchestrator functions and return the results of, of those functions. And then, if we're looking to get breeds, you will see that this is actually a hard coded array of um, dog breeds that we're returning. Um, and then, in our sub orchestrator, which is a uh, train breed, uh, what we're doing is we're uh, retrieving the input from our um, main orchestrator, which is the name of the breed. Then we are basically calling get images. Um, and this is another activity function that, um, let's go ahead and check it out. Uh, what this get images um, function does, it, it reads the URL and the path for each image for a particular breed. And all of those images are stored in uh, Azure storage blob account. So as you can see here, I'm retrieving all files um, using shared storage shared key credential. Um, I'm using environment variable. So I'm reading the storage account and the name and the key from um, environment variables. And then using blob service plan, I'm actually um, retrieving all files that I have stored in my uh, storage account and then returning that 
to our sub orchestrator. Uh, so once we have all the images, then we need to create a tag. So if I go into the um, create tag function, you can see here that um, I'm basically making a call to the custom vision API um, using Axios. Um, and then I'm passing in a training API key, so using uh, environment variables as well. Um, and then if my response actually contains the name of our breed, then that means that we already have a tag created. Otherwise, we want to go ahead and create it. And this is another HTTP request that um, creates our tag using custom vision API. But the key thing to, to note here is that we are basically using the um, we are chaining different functions. So we're um, retrieving the list of images using the breed parameter. Then we are uh, creating a tag if we have to using the breed parameter. And finally, we are uploading images and passing in um, the tag that we've just retrieved earlier or created earlier and the list of images that we've retrieved earlier. Um, so this is a pattern that if we had to create using serverless functions, then we would have to um, create multiple functions and instead of passing in those parameters from one function to another we would actually have to um, we would have to store those parameters in a queue manage that queue alongside our functions so a lot more work on our side rather than use the seamless approach that allows us to chain functions um, very easily if you go check out the documentation of durable functions you'll see that um, this is just one of the five patterns that are being supported currently by durable functions. Um, you can also implement things like, for example, if you had to maybe um, trigger every 12 hours, you want to clean all of your um, all of your files and save that data to a database. So what you can do is using durable functions, you can basically parse a network path or a path in Azure storage, blob storage, and then for each file that you have in that particular container, you can then uh, trigger an activity function or a series of activity functions in parallel and um, have them save that data into a database. And then once all of these activity functions are completed, then we can say that, hey, this job is done. Um, so you can both pass um, start multiple functions concurrently, but what's really key in this fan in fan out uh, pattern is that you can immediately catch when all of these functions that we've started are um, are completed, and then execute another um, update if needed. Um, this is something that it's not extremely straightforward uh, to implement in a serverless environment. All right, so going back to our uh, deck. Let me just go ahead and so we've we've seen here how um, we've implemented the steps that I've listed earlier. Uh, this is our orchestrator function. This is an example of a create tag function that makes an HTTP request. Um, and I'm very grateful for your time and your attention today. Please make sure to reach out. Um, via Twitter if you have any any other questions um, and I've listed here first of all a URL that gives you access to um, give feedback for this particular session um, make sure to use the event code 7587 um, and then I listed here two different github repository where you can find the source code for um, a few applications that I've created using durable functions so first of all we have durable days um, this is um, this is a project that I've started building that allows you to use durable functions to um, intercept certain API requests and um, log and have them executed at a certain time, moment in time. Um, and then we also have the Spirit Dog application that's available for you to deploy uh, within your own Azure accounts. Uh, and I'm I, I finished with my demos and with my presentation. Uh, I guess that my main message here is that you should absolutely pay attention to this particular space. Uh, serverless doesn't have to be stateless. 
Um, and there's a lot of work that's being done at the moment, both in the academia space, but not only that, also in the enterprise space and the startup space to overcome these initial challenges related to state. Um, and I, I do strongly believe that serverless is it has a lot to offer and um, it is a type of architecture and a type of um, implementation that um, I'm very grateful that it, it's here for all of us to build products with um, very fast and easily. And I'm going to have a look at the chat here to see if there's any questions from any of you. Okay, so I see a few questions. Does this serverless functions share the same stack in the memory? Um, Shamin, thank you so much for the question here. So I guess that for the durable functions, um, they they share the memory in um, in the storage account. So that's the external memory, if we can call it that way. Um, when it comes to our serverless functions, regular ones, um, they will be sharing a certain portion of the memory that is being used when we call, make subsequent calls. Um, that's that's actually a, a good call out there, um, a trick for maintaining database connections um, is actually to store a global variable for your functions or a static variable for your function for your database connection and then reuse it across um, different function calls. Now, the, all of this happens um, within true isolation of your functions. So you don't have to worry that your customers uh, or different users will have access to different data that's not specific to their own instances. Um, another question from Matt is, what's the easiest way to do um, MFA from my organization to our customers, not in our organization? C-sharp example for this. Unfortunately, I, uh, I do not have a lot of experience with C-sharp, uh, but I think if I understand the question correctly, um, you want to be able to connect users, customers, that are in your organization with the ones that are not. Um, I would say that HTTP functions would probably help you with that. Um, now, if you don't want to expose this at all to uh, the um, to the outside world, um, you might want to or you want to make your endpoints more uh, secure. You can add tokens and then give your uh, customers access to those particular tokens. Um, otherwise, uh, you have to make sure that um, you deploy your application securely and you give them access through HTTP uh, functions. Can we possibly have links to the articles that the presenter has mentioned? Yes, of course, I will uh, make sure to post those links in the um, Meetup page. Is there a way to commonly encrypt the data and media that is stored in Azure? and related sites over and above the encrypted connection to Azure itself. Uh, so for this particular question, um, I would say that um, there's multiple ways of encrypting data and media. Um, I am not a security expert, so probably you'll want to check in with um, folks that have done a lot of work in this area uh, but generally there's for example in the blob storage um, you have this shared access signature that you can um, you can generate so that it will only give you access or give access to the customers and users that you want to give access for your data um, and then there's multiple types of uh, encryption that is available for blob storage accounts uh, that I invite you to uh, check out our documentation pages. Another question, is the code at the Azure site or is it um, in the Explorer on your computer? Uh, I'm 
I'm not sure I understand this question. Oh, so the code that I was running was actually in my local, um, and then I was connecting to an Azure storage account. Um, I don't have Explorer on my computer uh, because I'm running a, a Mac, uh, but generally with durable functions, you're going to have to um, use a, a blob storage connection so that um, the state of your function runs is being stored in, in that blob storage. Okay, is it possible uh, to tell us a bit about the last slide? Just curious to know. I'm not sure what's the last slide. Uh, if you're cu oh, if you're curious about the the quote itself, if human beings don't keep exercising their lips, their brains start working. It's actually a quote from uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which I thought was very humorous. Um, it talks about a, a population that uh, basically. Um, was much smarter when they didn't talk. Um, so I thought that it's that it's time for me to stop talking um, and listen to your questions and listen to everything that you're saying. All right, well, I am very, very grateful for your time and uh, congratulations for dedicating this hour of learning. Um, and let me know if you have any other questions, um, either via email on the meetup, the meetup page or um, on our on my Twitter account, and please don't forget to submit your feedback at um, aka.ms/reactor/survey uh, with the event code 7587. And check out the resources that I've listed here. I hope they're useful. And let me know what you're building with uh, serverless and with durable functions. Thank you so much.